Our speaker today is Rui Ozari from the Weizmann Institute in Rehovot in Israel. Um, Rui is uh, very well known in the community. Um, he's received his uh, BSc from Hebrew University in Jerusalem and then went on to um, do a master's thesis and a PhD uh, in physics at the Weizmann Institute uh, with Nina Davidson on um, neutral atom um, quantum gases uh, and BECs. And he did his thesis on the spectro spectroscopic study of excitations in the Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, from uh, um, there, he went on to do a postdoc at the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado, NIST, um, with Dave Weinland from 2003 to 2007. And he worked on an experiment that used um, mixed crystals of uh, magnesium and beryllium to carry out elementary um, quantum operations and uh, made some very important uh, contributions to the uh, fidelity of uh, Raman uh, driven quantum gates and to, the, um, uh, to obtaining uh, long lived qubits. He um, then went on to work at um, Weizmann Institute, uh, again, as a now a full professor. And he has received, um, his field is, is, is iron trapping. He's received uh, numerous awards for his work. Uh, among them, um, a recognition uh, by the uh, Dean's List uh, for his uh, undergraduate BSc thesis, uh, and a prize for his uh, master's thesis, um, a PhD Excellence Fellowship uh, from the Israeli Council for Higher Education Planning, Rothschild found a post postdoctoral prize fellowship, the JFK uh, Excellence Award from the Weizmann Institute of Science, the Levinson Physics Prize, and he's also received the Haaretz Short Story Writing Competition Prize in 2015, I hear. We are extremely grateful to have you uh, with us today, um, Rui, and uh, we're looking forward uh, to your talk with the title, Searching for New Light Scalar Forces and Dark Matter Using Precision Spectroscopy. The audience is yours. Thank you very much, Christian, um, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Christian and Stefan and Klaus um, for your kind uh, invitation to uh, present our work here. What I'd like to tell you about today uh, is indeed how to uh, or about searches for new light scalar forces and dark matter using precision spectroscopy. Uh, precision spectroscopy has always been, uh, but today it's becoming an ever more popular tool to look for new physics, physics beyond the standard model. And I'd like to use this opportunity uh, to tell you a little bit about our modest, uh, my group's modest contribution towards that end. Uh, the reason that I'm, you know, I portrayed here uh, on the introduction slide, a qubit, uh, which is, you know, it's a building block of quantum information, is because precision spectroscopy can be used in a, in a traditional way to search for new, uh, new physics. You could also try and, and engineer the sensors that you're working with in order to better match the new physics signal uh, that you're going to use. And many of the techniques that we borrow in order to engineer our sensors come from the world of quantum information, quantum computing, um, which is something trapped ion or ion trappers uh, deal with quite a lot. Okay, so, you know, if we're looking for, for new physics, we need to motivate why to do that. Why are we looking for uh, physics which lies beyond the standard model of, <clears throat> of particles and fields? Um, after all, the standard model was a huge success in modern physics um, in predicting most of the phenomena that we're, uh, that we're observing. Having said that, uh, there are several very important problems that the standard model cannot explain. And I've listed here a short list of, of maybe the notable of those, uh, the hierarchy problem, uh, which is, uh, alludes to the, to the you know, many orders of magnitude, 24, I believe, between the electroweak uh, scale and the scale of gravity. The strong CP problem, uh, which asks the question why CP symmetry is violated so weakly uh, in the strong force, whereas in principle, it could have been uh, violated, violated strongly or completely. Uh, we know that neutrino, has a finite mass and it oscillates 
um, and that is not accounted for within the standard model. Um, you know, most of these problems, uh, these three problems, you know, they, they can be explained within the standard model with fine tuning of, of standard model parameters. This is an extreme fine tuning and therefore not very appealing, but still it, they can be explained or contained within the standard model, heuristically at least. Um, this problem I think cannot be uh, explained by the standard model at all, even under fine tuning. Uh, gravitational and astrophysical observations tell us that 70% of the matter in the universe is made out of particles that are not within the standard model of, of particles and fields as much as we know. Uh, I'm sorry, I was talking about the dark matter. Um, and, that is, and that is clearly um, a problem that searches for a solution. Yeah, this, this problem is uh, the matter versus antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Uh, in principle, uh, the, the, uh, the symmetry between these two uh, cannot explain the strong asymmetry that we observe uh, and that was probably generated in the genesis of the universe. So all these problems really suggest that there's some physics that lies beyond the standard model and we're, we're motivated to search for it. And the search, I think there's, there's experiment and theory that go hand in hand on the one hand, uh, theorists are trying to come up with uh, suggestions for extensions to the standard model um, that would explain you know, as many as possible of the of the problems that I was that I was listing. And experimentalists, on the other hand, are trying to test these theories and constrain the existence of these hypothesized fields. Um, for for a couple of decades, uh, there was this. Um, what people refer to as WIMP magic, the fact that um, weak, weakly interacting massive particles that are at the electroweak scale, meaning with a mass of hundreds of, of GeV, uh, could explain the existence of dark, ma dark matter with a thermal production mechanism during the, during the early universe, and also uh, account for the supersymmetric partners of existing particles within supersymmetric theories. Um, theory motivated an experimental search of these relatively heavy uh, missing particles, either through direct detection searches or through missing momentum in high energy collisions, for example, in the LHC. And the fact that none of these uh, was yet found uh, covering, covering relatively large terrain of parameter space motivated uh, theorists to look for other type of, uh, other type of uh, missing fields, other type of extensions to the CERN model. And one type of such extension is lightning physics. Physics, which is in which the particles have a mass below one EV. In this case, uh, because the particles are mass uh, and because we know that dark matter is bound to galaxies, we know that these, these fields are, or these particles are non-relativistic. They need to travel at relatively slow velocity in order not to escape uh, from the gravitational attraction of galaxies. We also know that these particles need to be bosons, uh, otherwise at the density of uh, dark matter of roughly 0.3 uh, uh, EV per centimeter cube, if I'm not mistaken, uh, their Fermi energy would become relativistic. And also um, under one EV, if we look at, uh, if we look at, these, um, uh, at these particles, they're the Broglie wavelength uh, is larger um, than their, than their intraparticle spacing. And in that case, uh, they would behave as a BC, if you like. So the way these fields would behave like would be similar to a classical field, which is oscillating at the Compton frequency um, uh, of this field. And there are several, several theoretical uh, models that could fit such like new physics, uh, starting with axions, uh, and axion like particles, ALPS. Um, these are pseudo scalar, maybe pseudo vector fields. Dilatons, which are scalars. Uh, relaxions, um, which are a particle that results out of a dynamic relaxation mechanism uh, starting at the, at the genesis uh, of the universe and, and maybe more theories. Um, and the, the rest of my talk is going to be dedicated to search of of fields like this.
uh, lightning physics. So, you know, the, we already mentioned that a large part of the search for new physics, an important part of the search for new physics is done through large accelerators and high energy collisions. However, one can ask whether you can use tabletop in order to search uh, for, these, uh, for these new fields. And people have been using, you know, I think since the uh, probably late 19th century, people has been have been using spectroscopy in order to try and open an, a window into new physics. That's how quantum mechanics was discovered. In many ways, that's how atomic structure was discovered. Precision spectroscopy is still being used today um, in order to, uh, to search for new physics. And I think that, you know, considering the revolution that laser cooling brought about to, uh, to spectroscopy, today's state-of-the-art spectroscopy is at the 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus 19 relative accuracy level. And that suggests that this tool is, is now, you know, sufficiently, sufficiently strong to maybe harness it. Um, into trying and, and actually detect these. So can we use spectroscopy in tabletop experiments to detect uh, these weakly interacting particles? They're interacting weakly with normal matter, but our spectroscopy can be performed with, with really mind-blowing accuracy. Maybe we, can, maybe we can find these new particles considering this, the precision at hand. And, and one way to, uh, to think, or one option at least, to detect new physics is by looking at the very small modification that these fields would result in atomic spectra or molecular spectra. Uh, you know, these are bosonic fields, and these bosonic fields will now mediate an interaction between the electrons and the nuclei. Can we detect this small modification to our atomic spectra and, and really get a, you know, get a clue as for what is, what is that new uh, physics that, that hides uh, in these interactions. And the answer is that in principle, yes, but you really have to differentiate between these forces and the very strong uh, electromagnetic interaction between the electrons and the nuclei. You need, you need a mechanism that will, will let you do that. And, and, there, I guess there are two avenues that can be pursued. One avenue can be pursued if these, these new physics, these new fields, these new particles, mediating particles, do not respect the symmetries that QED does respect. And in that sense, if you, if you flip the symmetry of your experiment, you will be able to detect that little extra interaction that hides on top of the very, very strong QED interaction. And a great example here would be, for example, electron, uh, a permanent electron electric dipole moment, which would not respect CP symmetry, whereas QED does respect that symmetry. So if you flip the CP symmetry, charge parity symmetry of your experiment, and you see a change to the spectra of a molecule or an atom, you know that you've discovered a new mechanism in action. Um, you know, parity symmetry is violated through the weak force. So it is violated with, with electroweak symmetry uh, uh, interactions. Um, however, it's a very weak uh, uh, parity symmetry breaking uh, interaction within the weak interaction, and therefore maybe a small you know, additional parity breaking uh, interaction can be detected this way. However, if uh, these new particles are scalars or vectors for that matter, and respect the same symmetries QED respects, then you can't, you can't really use that symmetry breaking trick in order to find them. What you need to do uh, is, is you know, find other tricks. And turns out that you know, even with a scalar Yukawa interaction like this, that connects the electrons to the nucleus, you can still find tricks uh, to find these, these forces under two conditions or under one condition that they're sufficiently like. If you like that these are long range interactions, they're not contact interactions um, and that their Compton frequency uh, is, relatively, is relatively low, either or I should say. So this is really about uh, detecting modifications to interactions between atomic or molecular constituents. In other words, here the fields are virtually excited. So this is off shell interaction through the new vacuum, if you like, between the electron and the nucleus. We don't have to, uh, to search for, for new physics this way only. We know 
or at least as far as we know, you know, we're surrounded by these fields through dark matter. Dark, we have a dark matter halo to our galaxy. That means dark matter, we have a dark matter flux going through us, through our laboratories all the time. And as we discussed before, we know this flux look, looks like a classical oscillating field. It's a field that oscillates at a frequency which is given by the Compton frequency of this, of this new particle. So if this new particle um, is, is at, you know, the mass is 10 to the minus 8 EV, we're talking about a field that oscillates at one megahertz. If it's 10 to the minus 11 EV, we have a field, the background field oscillating at one kilohertz. If it's 10 to the minus 14 EV, it's one hertz and so on. And you know, if it's lighter particles, the oscillator drift or the change in the field amplitude could, could be as slow as, as one year. The period could be as slow as one year. The amplitude of this classical field um, you know, would go as the square root of the density of dark matter around us, which you know, we, can, we can make some pretty reasonable assumptions on that dark matter density. And it'll go down like one over the, uh, the dark matter mass. This is because we know the dark matter density due to its gravitational effect. Uh, if the mass is larger, that means uh, that, means that um, uh, the density in terms of energy is, is lower. And that means that the amplitude of the field, the amplitude of the field is smaller. And you know, I think the first uh, ideas along these lines are by this really nice seminal paper by Arvin Ataki and Wang and, and Van Tilburg from 2015 asking the question of whether such scalar field, and I think in their, in their paper they were uh, referring to dilettons, when it oscillates, we can observe these oscillations as a time dependence on our, on our uh, spectroscopic observations. So I think these are, these are two approaches. And I think both these approaches are, are, are valid and both these approaches are, are followed. And, and I'll, I'll tell you about both these directions in a little bit. But before we do that, um, in order to explain in what way we would like to engineer our spectroscopic experiment, engineer our quantum probes, our, our atoms, if you like, to pick up on these signals, Let's look a little bit about the way we do spectroscopy. And what I'm gonna describe now is, is Ramsey spectroscopy. So spectroscopy through performing a Ramsey experiment on an atomic transition. The first part of a Ramsey experiment is by applying what we call uh, a pi over two pulse. That means that we, we, uh, we have, um, you know, we're, I'm sorry, I should say that the, the purpose of this Ramsey spectroscopy experiment is picking up or detecting a sigma Z signal, which would represent either a modification of the atomic spectrum that we have. That means the sigma Z operator symbolizes that we're shifting the atomic resonance from where we think it is to a different position. Or, you know, that sigma Z operator could be time dependent. That means that we have a time dependent modification or change to our atomic levels. We're using this Ramsey spectroscopy experiment in order to pick up on the signal. signal. So the way we do it is by uh, applying a pi over two pulse with uh, a resonant laser field or a resonant electromagnetic field that generates an equal superposition of our ground and excited state of our, of our two level atomic system. We wait for some time and then we apply another pi over two pulse and we scan the phase of that pulse between zero and two pi. And what we record is a fringe. So we record an oscillating function that tells us what is the probability of detecting our, our superposition at the excited state after applying these two pi over two pulses, okay? And um, if you look at the phase that we acquire uh, or the phase that we measure in this, uh, in this um, in this uh, Ramsey experiment, that phase of superposition equals to uh, this Hamiltonian term times the, uh, the time uh, that was acted. So H bar psi times the time that was acted. If you know what is the Ramsey time, we can extract psi. We can estimate uh, our, our spectroscopic signal and therefore estimate this, this field, if you like. Now, how well can we know uh, what is the, what is the uh, parameter? Or how well can we know psi? What is the uncertainty to psi? And the uncertainty to psi 
is limited by the fact that we have a single quantum probe that we measure over and over again. Each time we flip a coin and we measure the probe either in the up state or the down state. These probabilities that we see here, this is actual data from, from our lab, is the result of averaging over, over many, many times. And the average position would be you know, as close to the actual uh, probability and limited by the variance, if you like, or the standard deviation of this coin flip uh, statistical noise. And the uncertainty due to this standard quantum limit would be given but one over the square root of the number of times that we flip the coin, if you like, the square root of the number of times that we repeat the experiments, uh, and will go as one over, one over the time of the experiment. So longer Ramsey times will, of course, give us due to a Fourier relation, better spectroscopic uh, accuracy. So uh, what happens, this is the ideal, the ideal scenario. What happens if we have noise? So if we have noise, um, which, is, uh, which is, if you like, fast as compared to the time it takes us to average this experiment, what noise would do is it would reduce the fringe contrast. Instead of measuring a full 100% contrast, we would measure a contrast which is, which has a slower amplitude. And in this case, uh, presentation is stuck for some reason. Um, and in this case, we cannot long for, you know, for arbitrary long Ramsey times. That is because after too long of a time, the Ramsey contrast would wash away and we won't have any phase sensitivity. Turns out that the optimal time for Ramsey coherence is the decoherence time. If you like, it's the one over E time of a Ramsey, of a Ramsey uh, contrast. So in Ramsey spectroscopy, uh, this is data from, from our lab. Uh, you can see here uh, a picture of three strontium plus ions, and we operate on a superposition of an optical clock transitions. We prepare superpositions of the ground and excited state of this clock transition. At zero time, we see a nice Ramsey fringe. After about six milliseconds, uh, we see that the, Ra the Ramsey fringe is washed away. And that happens due to dephasing, due to laser phase noise or fluctuations of magnetic fields. And really, this is the enemy to our spectroscopic precision. So if we would like to go ahead uh, and measure these very weak signals that would indicate new physics, what we need to do is, is to get as precise spectroscopic probe as we can. That means that we need to try and find a way to get rid of all these laser phase noises and fluctuations uh, in, in, in atomic transition frequencies due to environmental noises uh, and so on. One way to do it, um, and that's what usually clock people are doing, is to try and decouple our system from the environment as much as we can and build uh, lasers, if you like, electromagnetic oscillators with as much as possible uh, low phase noise. Another approach is to try and engineer your quantum sensor such that it, while still being able to, to pick up on the signal that you're interested in, it is largely protected against noise. And this is, this is really you know, a whole field of research uh, which was pursued for the last two decades at least in the quantum information community. And people have come up with, with several methods and strategies uh, with which you could keep a superposition alive even in the face of noise. And you know, one such example is dynamic decoupling, and I'll, I'll give you an example in a little bit. Another such example is the use of decoherence free subspaces. These are entangled subspaces. Another example is the use of quantum error correction codes. In all these cases, what you do is you generate uh, a superposition of a protected subspace, if you like, or an engineered subspace of your entire Hilbert space. Uh, this is not the bare atomic superposition. Uh, it's a composite or addressed atomic superposition. Um, and and these, these strategies have proved extremely useful in protecting quantum superpositions against noise. Um, now that means that uh, if you use these protected subspaces in order to perform metrology, in order to detect new physics, you need to make sure that new physics is not identical to the noise operators that you're protecting against. Otherwise, 
your, your signal would be thrown out the window together with your nose operators. You have to uh, make sure that these superpositions while protecting against noise can still pick up on the signal. And these signals can be, can be non-trivial. They can be you know, encoded in intricate, intricate correlations or they could, they could penetrate this protected subspace somehow, but your engineering should, should be such that um, you're protected against noise. So noise cannot generate any evolution in the subspace, but your new physics signal would. Um, and you know, in the rest of the talk, I would like to describe uh, three experiments that we ran in our group all along these lines. We designed these protected subspaces and then use these subspaces in order to measure signals that at the end of the day would give us indication and allow us to, to place bounds on the existence of these new light uh, scalar fields um, or other extensions to the standard model. So the first, um, and the way, I think the way we'll, we'll go through this is Initially, I'll describe a method that protects against noise, and then I'll describe the way this method is harnessed in order to look for new physics. So the first method I'd like to uh, walk you through is that of dynamic decoupling. In a dynamic decoupling sequence, we add to the Hamiltonian term that we've discussed before. This is the signal we're trying to, uh, to uh, measure. We add a very strong, or a much stronger, I should say, Hamiltonian term that does not commute with a signal um, or sorry, I'm, does not commute with, with the noise operator that we would like to, uh, to, to uh, circumvent. So we have an oscillate, time oscillating sigma x operator here with an amplitude. Now, if this Hamiltonian term is much larger than this Hamiltonian term, it would dominate the eigenspectrum of this Hamiltonian. So now instead of the eigen eigenstates of the Hamiltonian lying along the z direction of the block sphere. Now the eigenstates will lie along the x direction of the block sphere. So my eigenstates now would be approximately equal to the plus and minus, minus x. In other words, the plus and minus superposition of my ground and excited states. Now these states are not going to be degenerate now and they'll have a gap between them which would be determined by the strength with which the sigma x operator acts. In other words, the Rabi frequency of this, of this sigma x term. Now, when I do that, um, the reason I would not suffer from dephasing is because if dephasing would occur due to time variation of the sigma z operator here. Now the sigma z operator here, in order for it to induce transitions between plus and minus x, it needs to oscillate on resonance with a gap between these two, these two sigma x terms. So if there is an overlap between the time dynamics under the sigma z operator, okay, I need to get rid of my, I need to get, there we go. Um, so in order for noise to actually couple between the plus and minus x operators, it needs to oscillate on, re on resonance with the time dynamics, with the Rabi frequency of this operator here. So given a noise spectrum that is described by this blue curve here, if my system oscillates, if my Rabi frequency overlaps with the noise spectrum, the phasing would still work. But if I make sure that my time evolution here, my Rabi frequency is parked at a place where my noise spectrum doesn't have any power spectral density, the noise would not be able to couple between plus and minus x components here. And then my superposition is, is protected. How does it look in the lab? So here is a, a, an example of an experiment that we ran on uh, superpositions of ground electronic states in a single trapped ion. So superpositions of, of uh, down and up states of a single spin, uh, a single electronic spin in the ground state. And we looked for the Ramsey contrast, so the Ramsey coherence of our superposition as a function of the modulation frequency, so like the frequency with which we apply these, these echo pulses, these pi pulses. What you can see very clearly is that if we oscillate our frequency at a sufficiently fast rate, so the modulation frequency is above 
let's say 250 hertz, we can maintain coherence for a long time. In this case, we could extend our coherence. If you remember, our coherence was limited to a few milliseconds before. We can extend our coherence by two or three orders of magnitude to the second, to the second scale. So if our Ravi frequency, if you like the period with which we apply, the frequency with which we apply these pi pulses is sufficiently fast, we can protect our superposition against noise. However, you can also notice that uh, whenever our modulation rate hits uh, uh, an integer multiple of 50 Hertz, we get a very significant decrease in our Ramsey contrast. The reason is that when that happens, we get maximal overlap between our noise spectra, which is dominated by harmonics of the electric grid of 50 Hertz in, in Israel, 60 Hertz in the US, Europe also 50 Hertz. Um, we get a perfect overlap between the magnetic field noise, the noise power spectral density that dominates our experiment and our modulation frequency. The other way of looking at this, at this experiment is we have an extremely good sensor of picking up separately 100 hertz noise, 150 hertz noise, or 50 hertz noise, every time we match the modulation frequency, the frequency with which we apply pi pulses to be 50 hertz or 100 hertz or 150 hertz. So at the same time as having protection against our noise, we can also build a, a very narrow spectral filter that can pick up on, on very particular uh, time modulation sequences. So on the one hand, we have uh, a way of protecting against noise. On the other hand, we have a spectrum analyzer, a quantum spectrum analyzer, which is very sensitive to a particular noise uh, or signal frequency. Uh, the experiment I've shown you before was an experiment on, on Zeeman superpositions. We then uh, went and performed this experiment. Uh, this was led by Ravid Chani, who was a PhD student in my group. Uh, we performed this experiment on superpositions of optical clock, uh, uh, an optical clock transition. Um, here we scanned the frequency between, um, um, between, uh, between two pi over two pulses. Again, we, we, we implemented a sequence of pi pulses, and now we were sensitive to signals that were oscillating basically at the frequency with which we were applying these pi over two pulses. Now, um, so contrary to the uh, to ground state qubits here, because this is a clock superposition, we're sensitive to Doppler shifts. And because we're sensitive to Doppler shifts by applying mechanical forces on the ion at frequencies that were equal to the frequency with which we apply these pi pulses, we could actually detect very, very small forces uh, that were acting on our, on our trapped ion. In this case, we could show a sensitivity uh, of 10 to the minus 20 Newton per square root Hertz. And after integrating uh, for about a hundred seconds or so, uh, we were able to show sensitivity to forces at the 10 to the minus 21 uh, Newton. Under these weak forces, uh, the ion was wobbling around its equilibrium position by an amount which equals an optical wavelength divided by a thousand or 0.5 uh, nanometer. Nevertheless, we could measure that uh, with good statistical significance. Um, and one other thing to say is that these forces were, were uh, operating at a frequency of one kilohertz, which is three orders of magnitude below the mechanical resonance of our ion. Uh, usually when people use mechanical oscillators, in this case, the ion is a mechanical oscillator, to pick up on weak forces, it's done at forces that are on resonance with a mechanical resonance of that, of that oscillator such that the response of the oscillator would be amplified. Here we're able to measure forces that were much slower than the mechanical uh, frequency uh, of the oscillator. So we have a very good uh, AC, uh, AC uh, force sensor or AC sensor, if you like. Um, as I said here, the, the, uh, the, the force sensing was done at, at a frequency of one kilohertz, can we use this tool in order to measure these uh, scalar dark matter oscillations that we've discussed before? Uh, if you remember, uh, dark matter in this case uh, would look, dark matter is, is light, 
it would look as a classical field that would oscillate in the background of our lab with a frequency that equals the Compton frequency uh, of, of uh, corresponding to the mass of that dark matter, of the dark matter particle. Um, this work uh, was done really under the guidance of a wonderful theory group uh, here at the Weizmann Institute led by Gilad Perez and uh, the two PhD students leading this were in Bar Savoy and, and Shachar Faroni. And again, Ravid Shaniv was the experimentalist on this measurement. In fact, what we did is we took the data from Ravid's force measurement uh, and the, basically the reference of this experiment was done without applying any mechanical force on the ion. And that was the data that we used in order to, uh, to look for a dark matter of the light. So how would dark matter uh, of the type we discussed before give rise to oscillations in, in atomic levels? Well, uh, under pretty general uh, assumptions, um, the Lagrangian of, of this, of this uh, field would couple, so there'll be coupling of this field phi is the amplitude like the operator of this, of this new dark matter field, it'll couple to uh, both to the electromagnetic fields. So F to F nu nu, F nu nu in the Lagrangian, and it'll also couple to the electron, uh, both with some coupling string uh, that is uh, parameterized these G parameters here. And this coupling, both to the electromagnetic field and to the electron, would also lead to a modification of the fine structure constant and a modification to the, to the electron mass. And the modification to both these parameters would be, would, would be equal to the coupling strength of that new field to the electron and the electromagnetic field respectively and the expectation value of this, of this field. Um, okay, so... Um, if now we have a classical field that oscillates at the Compton frequency of this new particle, if you remember that frequency uh, for a particle, um, if I remember correctly, 10 to the minus 11 EV uh, mass would oscillate at the kilohertz lab in the lab would lead to oscillations of the uh, atomic frequency across the laser frequency um, at, at exactly that, that Compton frequency. Um, so, um, you know, if, if our atomic frequency is sensitive to changes in the fine structure constant and in the electron mass, and here we're parameterizing d alpha and dME as the relative change to the fine structure constant and the relative change to the electron mass, if we measure these oscillations, we can extract the coupling constant, uh, the coupling strength of this new field to the electron um, and to the, and to the uh, electromagnetic fields and to the photons. Um, in order to do that, of course, we need to assume some dark matter density. We need to make some assumption on the amplitude with which this classical field is oscillating in our lab. Um, as I said, we have a, an estimate of the, of the dark matter density around us, uh, which is due to gravitational observations. Uh, it's roughly 0.3. EV per squared uh, per squared centimeter. If we if we don't observe these oscillations and we can bound these oscillations, so if we don't observe, you know, you know a, a, um, a non-zero value to these D parameters, but we can place a bound on how small they are, then we can place a bound on on these couplings uh, of of this new hypothetical dark matter field, both to the electron as well as to, uh, to the electromagnetic, uh, to electromagnetic fields. Good, so um, in our experiment, we take a laser. Our laser is usually, it's a narrow laser. It's usually referenced to some cavity. Um, and we use that laser in order to induce, uh, to, to explore the transition frequency of, of atoms, of, of a trapped ion. Now the transition frequency of our trapped ion, and you know, if this is an optical electronic transition, it would scale according to the Rydberg constant, meaning it will be proportional to the fine structure uh, constant squared and then the times the electron mass. The uh, laser frequency on the other hand would, would go as one over the cavity length 
the cavity length would be proportional to bore's radius. So if you like, you know, one way to think uh, of the cavity is if the fine structure constant, for example, varies, that means that all the atoms change their, change their linear size, and that means the cavity length changes uh, respectively. Bohr radius is proportional to one over uh, the mass of the electron times the fine structure constant. So the relative change to the, uh, to the frequency of our ion or our atom uh, would be given by twice the relative change to the fine structure constant plus the relative change to the electron mass. And the relative change to the laser frequency, uh, which is inversely proportional to the uh, to Bohr's radius, would scale as uh, the just the relative change to the fine structure constant plus the relative change to the electron mass times some uh, you know, times some spectral response function, if you like. And the reason you have to include the spectral response function is that if these oscillations are too quick, the cavity length would not be able to follow. And therefore the laser frequency, for example, if these, if these oscillations are faster than the average lifetime of the photon in the cavity, that means that my locking signal to the cavity would not know that the cavity frequency was changed on our, my locking signal that would look like side bends. It wouldn't change the locking point of my laser to the cavity and therefore my laser frequency uh, wouldn't, wouldn't change at all. So if these changes are faster than the optical time scale, the, the optic that one over the time a photon is, is, is trapped in the cavity or for example, uh, the, the time the cavity can acoustically respond to changes in both cases for these cavities, this is in the kilohertz range, but of course, you know, based on your favorite cavity, you could put here a different response function. Um, the cavity becomes, if it's too fast, the cavity becomes an integrator. That actually brings about a, a pretty, a, a pretty, uh, I think, unique, uh, unique point uh, to pay attention to. Um, you know, if, if you read this review of modern physics by Uzan, uh, for many years, it was I think it was it was believed that only dimensionless constants can have a time variation. And indeed, you see that if the laser frequency and the ion frequency are you know are are adiabatically changed, then the changes to the electron mass are not going are not going to induce to induce any change uh, in in this comparison. The only change would be due to changes in hyperfine constant which is indeed a dimensionless parameter. However, if these two do not change, do not dynamically react the same way. So if one of them you know, cannot react due to this uh, averaging and the other one can react, the, the response time of an atom is, is very, very fast. It's optically fast. Then in this case, uh, you know, if the cavity becomes an integrator, you can actually be, um, you can be sensitive to time changes uh, in a dimension, uh, dimension four parameter, which is the electron mass here. And there's a very nice uh, recent archive by these uh, five gentlemen that actually uh, desc describes this uh, very accurately. So in our experiment, uh, again, we ran a, a, a dynamic decoupling sequence between two pi over two pulses, a sequence of, of pi pulses at the kilohertz range. Um, we looked at the, uh, at the contrast of a Ramsey fringes. The contrast of a Ramsey fringes is indicative of noises that overlap our modulation frequency. And you know, by looking at our Ramsey contrast, we could limit the strength with which we have oscillating background signals with a given coupling to our, to our atomic uh, system that act at, uh, at, this, at this frequency. Um, and what you see here is a limit to our fractional frequency change at the kilohertz range. Kilohertz range is, is here at the 10 to the minus 11 EV. So the X axis here, instead of being frequency is, is the mass of leading particle. You see that we're mostly sensitive at one kilohertz. That was the frequency of our dyna dynamic decoupling. We lose sensitivity as we go away. And in fact, we have these resonances in which we're not sensitive at all. And that's just due to uh, accident, if you like, uh, mis mismatch, uh, a pure, a perfect matching between the oscillating signal 
um, and, and this, um, and this uh, uh, modulation frequency. You can see here that uh, we have two regimes, a regime where the cavity responds you know, up to the few kilohertz range where we're only sensitive to changes in the fine structure constant, and then the high frequency range where we're sensitive both to changes in the fine, in the fine structure constant as well as changes to the electron mass. If we have a bound on the relative frequency change, which in this case is in the 10 to the minus 13 level, and that can be significantly improved. Uh, we can also extract bounds on the coupling of dark matter to our atomic ion. Uh, the dashed line here is a projection of what would be the limit to our ability of measuring these time oscillating signals uh, in the presence or due to the fact that our superposition has a finite lifetime and due to quantum projection always integrating over a month. So I think with this, these two reasonable assumptions, uh, these limits can be uh, improved by three or so orders of magnitude. One thing to notice about this, uh, this method is this method, because it looks at decoherent spectroscopy, and I'm not gonna say much about it, is quadratically sensitive to the oscillating signal and not linearly oscillating. Uh, uh, sensitive to the oscillating signal. Okay. Um, so, I'm sorry, my presentation just got stuck. Okay, I think I need to reopen it. Oh, these things happen. <laughs> you see it now? Yeah, it's perfect. It's the title slide again. Okay. So using these, I think that we're relatively slow with time. Um, I'll just say that using these uh, bounds on the relative frequency, uh, variations, we're able to extract a bound on, um, on the uh, changes, both to the uh, coupling of this new scalar field to the electromagnetic, electromagnetic forces, as well as to the electron mass. What I'm showing you here is the electromagnetic forces. This is the bound here uh, that you see here. This is the projected bound. These bounds are still not competitive with respect to a bound, for example, that is extracted by equivalence principle measurements. Equivalence principle measurements look at, again, these are off, off shell cups. So this, this would be a force which is mediated between two masses by this scalar, by this scalar field. However, using our method, you, you get a direct uh, handle on the frequency with which these uh, oscillations occur. And again, this, this bound is extracted using some assumption on the uh, dark matter, uh, the dark matter density around us. Um, here we're using a uniform density across the galaxy. Uh, some models, um, which were actually uh, developed uh, in part by uh, Gilad Perez and his group, uh, can show that uh, you can have a dark matter halo, which would be gravitationally bound by uh, Earth. These would be dark matter stars. And in this case, if the local dark matter density is much larger, uh, then at least our projected bound would be able to extend uh, well below uh, the bounds that are given by equivalence principle uh, experiments. So this is, if you like, direct dark, dark matter search. I should also mention the two very similar experiments uh, were conducted and published recently. One uh, in Jilla in the group of the Koch Maestro uh, Juni and with uh, strong uh, theory collaboration with Andrei Derevyenko. Here, a silicon cavity, which I think was, uh, was developed in, 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 um, in collaboration with PTB in Germany and compared with, with the strontium lattice clock, again, using either direct clock, uh, comparis uh, direct clock comparison between the two or a dynamic decoupling sequence was able to, uh, to look at bounds in the lower mass range down to 10 to the minus 16 EV. And in a, in a beautiful experiment in the group of Dima Butchker um, and uh, led by Genesis Antipas, here they looked at time variation 
of, uh, of spectroscopy of a strong dipole transition. Here, the dipole transition is relatively wide. And therefore, you could look for variations in the megahertz and tens of megahertz range. And here, the, uh, uh, the bounds that were extracted using this spectroscopic uh, uh, experiment uh, could go all the way up to 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 7 EV. Um, and I know Dima gave a, a talk at one of your seminars uh, a month or so ago and, and described this experiment among many other experiments. Good, so um, we're almost, uh, we're 50 minutes, I guess, down uh, this path. Um, so I guess what, I, what I'd like to uh, do now is change gears and very quickly tell you about a different approach into, um, into investing or trying to find uh, new forces, again, using engineered subspaces. In this case, the way we reject dephasing noise, the way we reject uh, the decoherence that our system, system experiences is not by time dynamic modulating our Hamiltonian, but rather by resourcing to entangled states. So in this case, if you have some dephasing, which is due to uh, noise in the energy gap between your down and up states, one way to overcome this is by engineering a two-level system, which is composed out of superpositions of down, up, and up, down states. Now, these superpositions are entangled states. This is the singlet and the triplet m equal zero states of, of, of spin, uh, spin zero or spin one. However, any noise that would lift the degeneracy between down and up, but would do so in a way which is uniform across, across both these systems, would not lift the degeneracy between down, up, and up, down. It would only contribute a global phase to superpositions in the subspace. So this decoherence-free subspace is an excellent tool with which we can extend our coherence times excessively. Again, I'm showing you data which is taken on spin superpositions of the ground state electron in our ion. And I can show you that by encoding in this entangled subspace, we we're able to measure coherence times that extended all the way almost to one minute. So we have a very, very sensitive Ramsey sensor, but this sensor cannot change global changes to, uh, to the energy difference between up and down. It can, however, measure the difference changes between, between up and down. And we're going to use this decoherence free subspace in order to measure an isotope shift between two ions. So before I'll describe the way these isotope shift measurements are, are, are performed, I want to tell you very quickly why isotope shifts are, can be a great tool in order to detect uh, new physics. So the, the, the reason you know the, the energy uh, between two electronic states is different when we resource the different isotopes. So here you see different isotopes uh, with different uh, mass denoted by AA prime and, and A double prime. And every time we move between the different isotopes, and that means there's more neutrons in the nucleus, the same number of protons, uh, the frequency, the resonance frequency of our electronic transitions varies ever so slightly. And there are two reasons, two main reasons why that happens. You know, in principle, the Coulomb interaction between uh, the electron nucleus first order was not changed, but two things did change. One is that the mass in the center of mass frame where we, uh, where we calculate the spectrum, if you like, of our atom has changed and that resulted in some mass shift to the resonance frequency. And the other reason is that our, our nucleus is not, a, is not a point particle. It actually has a finite size. And that finite size is different when we move between different isotopes. It's a nuclear physics effect. The charge radius of the nucleus is different when you move between different isotopes. And therefore, the overlap of the electronic wave function with the nucleus would be different. And that would contribute to what people refer to as a field shift. And these two contributions would, would uh, contribute to the, um, to the um, to the, to the total isotope shift. Now, an interesting observation that was done by a spectroscopist in Oxford called, uh, I believe, William King in the 1960s was the following. If you take these two contributions, both of them can be written as one part, which only depends on the nucleus. It only depends on the isotope that you choose. In, in, uh, in, in the case of a mass shift, it would depend on the difference between the two reduced masses in, in 
in the two cases, and between A and A prime. And in the, in the field shift, it would only depend on the difference between the radius, the variance uh, of the charge radius between the two isotopes. These two factors that are shown in red do not depend on the transition that we choose. They only depend on the nuclear part of, the, of this isotope shift. However, there is another uh, uh, term here in this product, which would now depend only on the electronic wave function. In other words, on the transition that we're looking, we're looking at. So for example, in this field shift, it will only depend on the overlap of the electron in the two levels that are associated in the transition and the nucleus. So the, if you like the density of the electron um, at, at, R equal, at R equal zero. These contributions do not depend on the isotope. They only depend at least to, to first order on the electrons that I choose. So this is the King factorization. The fact that each of these terms can be denoted as a product of a term that depends only on the transition and a term that depends only on the isotope. Now for two transitions, I can divide uh, this, this equation by the difference in reduced masses, which means I'm gonna get the difference in frequency divided by the difference in reduced masses. If I know these masses accurately enough, and I know, for example, that Stefan here is an expert on measuring the masses of different isotopes extremely accurately. I know this modified isotope shift very accurately. And then I have two terms here. One of them is completely independent of nuclear factors, which are unknown to a large extent. And one of them depends on, on these nuclear factors. But if I take two transitions, I have two such equations and I can write them as one as a function of another, getting rid of this unknown nuclear part and then get a, a nice comparison between these two modified, uh, modified isotope shift, which lies on a linear line. Um, and that means that uh, you know, these comparisons uh, would, be, would, be highly, would be highly linear. Now what happens if I have a new force which is involved? This new force would add another uh, term that would contribute to the isotope shift, condition that this new force now mediates an interaction between the additional neutrons and the electron uh, which is involved. And let's assume that this uh, interaction has a Yukawa-like form with a range that is determined by the mass of this new field. Um, and if you take into account this term here, it is not proportional to the difference between the two reduced masses. And therefore this term here, when we go through the algebra that we went through before, would would, de would kink, would, would, would uh, bend kink plot away from linearity. And that means that if I measure kink plots with great accuracy and I see a linear comparison, that means like, again, I can put a bound on the existence of this new force. If I measure a nonlinear kink plot, then it could either be due to uh, kink nonlinearity or, or due to breaking of the assumptions between the kink comparison. This was, uh, uh, this was uh, again, a, a collaboration uh, with a large group of very talented theorists. Uh, again, Gilad Perez group, uh, Yotam Sorek, Cedric Delaunay, uh, um, um, Julian Berngut, Victor Flambaum, uh, Dima Budker, and many others. Um, and what you see here are the bounds that can be extracted by looking at different uh, comparisons and different atomic transitions along a sequence of isotopes in different atomic uh, species. Um, so what you see here is the bound that can be extracted by looking at two, uh, at two um, uh, optical clock transitions. Um, I'm sorry, two optical transitions and a calcium plus ion that was measured in Peach Meets uh, group at, at PTB, where the King plot was shown to be linear with uncertainty of about 100 kilohertz. Um, and you can see here that the coupling of, the, uh, of this new field, coupling it generate, or the product of couplings of that new field to the electron and neutron can be bound here at the 10 to the minus eight level uh, using some uh, natural units. These, these bounds, again, are not competitive, for example, with bounds that can be extracted from the G minus two measurement of the electron that again would be modified if this electron couples to new vacuum uh, fields, time a product that can be extracted from neutron scattering experiments that puts a limit of, this, of, the, 
of, of the coupling of these new fields to the neutron. This is shown by the blue region here. But if these measurements are performed with better accuracy down at the one hertz level or below, uh, these bounds can be competitive with other tabletop uh, experiments. The bounds that you see here in, in very light shaded uh, brown are bounds that are extracted from astrophysical observations and to a large extent are, are frequency dependent. And that motivates the performance of these experiments with much higher accuracy. Uh, next week, you're gonna hear, I'm sure, from Michael Grovson, and I'm not gonna steal the thunder there, of their recent experiment in our house, improving existing bounds, and another beautiful experiment by the uh, Vladimir Vuletic group at MIT, working on Ecurbium plus ions, uh, have also improved these bounds. Both these new bounds are still non-competitive with respect to G minus two times N, and if we would like to, um, to improve on these bounds uh, further, we need to measure isotope shifts with a resolution that exceeds one hertz. And um, I'm not gonna show you a full king plot measurement, but I will show you how we can measure isotope shifts with extremely good uh, resolution. And I'll do that in the last uh, few minutes of the talk. This is a measurement that was led by uh, Tom Anovitz and Tzana Ackerman um, at our trap line group at the Weizmann Institute. So if you'd like to uh, measure isotope shift uh, in a DFS, um, you know, the way you do it, if you remember the DFS, the decoherence free subspace I've shown you before, was composed out of a superposition of one quantum sensor being in the ground state and another quantum sensor being in the excited state and vice versa. If these two quantum sensors belong to the same atomic isotope, then we don't have any, uh, any frequency gap between these two states. They're completely degenerate. That's the reason actually they're, they're resilient against noise. However, um, if we now trap two ions in our, in our trap, and now one ion belongs to 88 isotope, strontium plus 88, and the other ion is strontium uh, plus 86, now these two states would not be degenerate. There'll be an energy gap between them, which would be equal exactly the isotope shift between these two, these two species. Now notice that if, because these, the, these two isotopes or these two states have the same quantum states, they have the same magnetic moment, um, the only thing to a large or to, you know, to first order, the only thing that would contribute to the energy gap here would be the isotope shift and it would be the isotope shift only. So in many ways, what we're doing here is we're synthesizing, if you like, an artificial sensor, an artificial atom, which is composed out of a two isotope entangled state, which evolves at the isotope shift directly. And this is, this is the frequency that we would measure in our generalized Ramsey experiments. Um, so this is, if you like, an atomic RF clock, but it's a synthetic atomic, atomic RF clock a synthetic clock that oscillates at 570 megahertz. So uh, the way we perform the experiment is fairly easy. We perform this generalized power of two pulse. We uh, compose this entangled superposition. We wait for some time T and we measure the phase evolution of this entangled superposition by closing this generalized Ramsey sequence. Um, the way you do it with trapped ions um, is by using you know, the well-known entanglement gates. In fact, here we didn't even need to use a universal gate set. We could, use, we could use a combination of blue and red sidebands in order to prepare this entangled superposition. Um, we waited some time, we applied some rotation pulses and measured, and what you see here are oscillating signals that are due to the uh, to the uh, shift of our local oscillator from the transition frequency of this entangled uh, superposition or from the isotope, from the isotope shift. Um, so by measuring this frequency, uh, we notice that the frequency uh, of this entangled superposition actually depends on two things we were not expecting it to depend on. We, we saw that it, may, it, it does depend slightly on the magnetic field that we have in our lab. And it does depend on the magnetic, on the projection of the states that we choose in the excited state on the magnetic field direction. So the M, le, the M uh, level that we choose in the excited state. 
Um, and the reason that it depends is because there is also a small shift to the magnetic susceptibility, to the magnetic moment of the excited state by going from one isotope to another. Um, I think one way to think about it is that when you go from one isotope to another, you change a little bit the, the radius with which the electron circulates uh, around the nucleus in the excited state. If you like, you change the radius of the current loop that it generates, and then you also change to some extent uh, also the, um, the magnetic moment of that current loop. Uh, by drawing a line through these experimentally measured points, um, we could uh, measure a variation of that magnetic moment at two parts in the 10 to the minus eight, and by extrapolating to the zero crossing of this uh, graph, we could also extract the isotope shift um, with uh, five millihertz statistical uncertainty, seven millihertz systematic uncertainty, uh, and nine millihertz total uncertainty, leading to a fractional uncertainty of the isotope shift at the 10 to the minus 11 level. And again, this is just one uh, isotope shift out of three necessary, and one transition out of two necessary to uh, get a full uh, king plot test but uh, uh, this isotope shift is, is certainly performed below one hertz. And when we'll pursue this along the isotope chain, um, we should be able to, uh, yeah, assuming linearity, we'll be able to uh, improve on bounds. If linearity would not be preserved, we'll either uh, have a window on new forces or measure the reasons due to which nuclear physics and QED uh, violate uh, King linearity. I think, uh, Christian, how are we doing with respect to time? Sorry, I have to turn my microphone on. Yeah. Uh, how much more time do you need? Well, I'm, I have three more transparencies that look at a different usage of-, of Okay, five of minutes shouldn't be a problem. I mean. Okay, so I, I wanted to conclude by showing you another, uh, you know, another limit that we could extend on move physics by using decoherence free subspace. In this case, by looking at ground state superpositions, and this is an experiment uh, that was done a few years ago by Nitzan Ackerman and, and Shlomi Kotler. In this experiment, what we looked at was the magnetic interaction between two, two electronic spins in our trap. Uh, the magnetic interaction between two electronic spins would be a dipole-dipole interaction, meaning you'll, you'll, the Hamiltonian would look something like this, the projection of the spin on the vector separating between these two dipoles and then the projection of these two dipoles, one on top of the other. Um, but both these Hamiltonian terms would be proportional to one over the distance cube between these two electrons. Um, and if you look at the magnetic interaction between two electronic spins, a typical separations between these two ions, you're talking about an interaction which is in the, in the millihertz range again. So in order to measure this interaction, again, we encoded our, our two ions in a decoherence-free subspace. Again, we have tens of seconds coherence time, but the eigenstates of this spin-spin uh, interaction Hamiltonian in this protected subspace are given by the sing singlet and the triplet M equals zero. And these states are non-degenerate now. And the gap between these two states is given by this few millihertz interaction energy. In other words, if we initialize our two spins, let's say in the up-down state, which is an equal superposition of these two states, slowly our two spins are going to become spontaneously entangled. Uh, eventually, this, the, the state will align itself with this entangled state. And the rate at which our spins become entangled is an indication of the magnetic interaction between them. Um, so this is exactly the experiment we performed. Uh, we encoded our two spins in this decoherence-free subspace and initialized them in the up-down state. We waited for 15 seconds and we saw these two spins or the state vector rotate. These two spin spins become spontaneously entangled. We could prove that they're entangled. And by doing that, we could extract the magnetic interaction between these two spins and compare it to the prediction of QED. Now, um, if if QED is not the final word, and there is another uh, axion field in the background, this axion field would mediate effective magnetic interactions between, uh, between these two spins. 
And the fact that our observation matched within our uh, experimental accuracy, the prediction of QED with respect to uh, the interaction between these two spins, we could actually place bounds in the existence. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is a bound that we extracted on the existence of axial vector bosons. Um, again, this is the boson mass, which would determine the you know, yukawa light range of this interaction um, and the strength with which this uh, axial vector field couples to both electrons. This work was done in collaboration with Derek Kimball. Um, and this, I, get, I think, is another nice example of the way a decoherence-free subspace can be used for precision spectroscopy and yield an improved bound uh, on, on new physics or extensions to the standard model. So this is really uh, what I wanted to say. Um, I'd like to conclude by acknowledging all the hardworking group of experimentalists in our group, as well as the many, many uh, talented theory collaborators that we have in our funding agencies. And I'll be happy to open this for, uh, for a discussion.